again, you're being an activist. I am it's not. That's not appropriate, sir. If you, who, who are you asking? What's your name? That's not an appropriate question for you to ask. I do, I you're going to ask how many questions? You get three? What a stupid son of a bitch. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Friendly Fire with Liberty Dad. Today, I'm going to bring on Eric Cordova. He is running for the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Florida. So I'm bringing him on. We're going to have a chit chat and we're just going to talk about whether or not he's up to the task. And I'm going to try to ask him some tough questions. Nothing too difficult. We just want to put our candidates feet to the fire just a wee bit just to kind of see um, how they'll do. Thus the name Friendly Fire. So let's go ahead and bring Eric on. Eric, how are you? A little intimidating now. Uh <laughs> You're getting that intro, we're going to feed to the fire. I'm already in Florida. It's already hot here. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so you, you know, you did, you are in Florida and you actually came from New York. Is that correct? Yes, I did. I was born okay. and raised in New York. Yeah. You're born and raised in New York. And then, I mean, would you just decide that DeSantis was better and therefore you were coming to Florida like everybody else? Well, I, I was here a little bit before DeSantis. I okay. came down here for college for the first time in uh, University of Florida. So okay. that was my first experience living in the state. I always loved it. Didn't know what I was going to do with that information. Just it was cool for college. Um, right. But when my wife and I met and we started coming down here and visiting, we were like, this is just a better place for us, better lifestyle. We're not – we're both born and raised in New York. We're just not mm – -hmm. we're not about the hustle-bustle – New York City-ness, you know, it's okay. just very high anxiety. We're, we're more, you know, get us in the suburbs, man. That That's where we belong. But, uh, right. yeah, I don't want to get into too much of the, you know, the Santa's and Hochul. That's like asking what, what smells better, a fart or a poop. Right, <laughs> right. No, I understand. And and I and I get it. You it wasn't really the politics so much. You traded, you know, uh, the violent crime in New York City for Florida man. And whatever that will entail. So having an alligator thrown at you, your face eaten off. I mean, you know, it's a lot less stressful. I mean, the <laughs> only gator we've seen in our backyard is a baby gator. I figure I right. can handle that a lot better than the homeless on the subway. I got a better shot. You know what I'm saying? Possibly. I, I would imagine so. All right. So let's get down to business here. So you're running for vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Florida. So give us a, now, I, since we were talking and you are coming to us from another state, that means there might be a, a lot of members who are not very familiar with who you are unless they follow. Like some people do a pretty good job of keeping up with other affiliates because I know that you were involved, I believe, in LP Queens, correct? Yes. So tell us. Tell us what you did there. Like, what are the kind of things that that got you prepared to come down here and run for vice chair of the state party? All right. So, yeah, my libertarian resume goes back a bit. I don't want to do this whole interview as just my resume, but let's let's oh, no, do no. The, uh, the Cliff Notes version, here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started getting involved probably something like ten years ago, but again, it wasn't really until I met my wife. And for our listeners, my wife is Gabrielle Cordova. She's been involved in the party as well. Okay. We both were libertarian Jewish people and we we're like, okay, cool. So we're getting married. That was easy. But the other part was, is we knew our lives are going to be centered around those things that libertarianism was going to be a big part of our lives. What we didn't realize is just how much it would become. The funny, the funny story I always give is the, our first Libertarian Party of Queens meeting that we went to was in 2017. Mm -hmm. It was at the Hooters. Okay. And there were three people there. And we were not super motivated to be like, wow, this is a great thing. This is a great political organization. I am dying to make an impact. That wasn't it. But we did go to a couple of speakers later that year, Aaron Comey and Larry Sharp. Okay of whom most people know he was beginning his campaign for governor of new york and right. that we were like okay cool we should be helping this guy out we like this guy so we did he got ballot access for the state of new york so now it's not just that we are a wannabe political party we are actually a political party that's how it worked in new york now we actually are a certified political party so now each county was tasked with becoming an official county organization as part of the Libertarian Party of New York. It was at that time that we had a meeting at who ended up being our chair's house and 30 some odd people showed up. And we were like, 
this is our call to action. This is real. There are people in suits and ties here ready to rock and roll, ready to do the business of political action. So it was at that time I got involved and I became the public relations and recruitment director of Libertarian Party of Queens, which okay. basically played into my background. I am a recruiter by trade. That's what I do for a living. Okay. Two years later, I became the vice chair. So that was in late 2019 into 2020. So for the next two and a half years, I was the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Queens. What we did was we took what is one of the most populated counties in New York and actually in the country, over 3 million people, more than quite a few states. And we were a nothing when it came to the Libertarian Party. We turned it into, we were running candidates year over year. We were able to build an infrastructure that allowed for that to happen. And we left and felt really good about the fact that we left it in such a place that the next people can pick up right where we left off. I, I say we, because Gabrielle and I were both on the board. She was the secretary, I was the vice chair. Mm -hmm. So what we were left with was we were leaving two vacancies on the board. Those have since been picked up. And of course, I wish those people the best. And I hope that, like I said, the infrastructure and the pieces that we left are going to lead them to even greater things than we did. But I'm a big believer in those things that we did, which are, like I said, full on party infrastructure. We, we built up a Google Drive that has every piece of information you could ever need of things that we did from 2019, January 2019 to December of 2022. Okay. I'll, I'll get into any specifics, but we built up fundraising. We built up candidate support. All Every aspect of what you should be doing as a political party, we did. So how does that prepare me for vice chair of Florida? I've been a vice chair, and actually, I'm a vice chair again. We were tasked with the same thing when we moved down here. We moved to Hillsborough County. Okay. And all I kept hearing from Floridians were, we don't have a Hillsborough chapter. They, they folded. It's not good over there. So... We said, let's get to work. And just over a month ago, we had our first meeting and I actually led that meeting. Um, and we were able to elect a new board, myself as vice chair. And we are now rock and roll. We have a full board. We're moving full speed ahead on getting recognized as a county affiliate, both with the Libertarian Party of Florida and with the County Board of Elections. I believe mm -hmm. those things are about 95% of the way there. And we're ready to work. We're ready to build the infrastructure so we can do, like I said, those things that you yourself as a county chair have been doing, which is getting candidates where they need to be in front of people, in front of the libertarians and in front of the world. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. And it's, it's great to hear that you are um, actively involved in your local affiliate. One of the things that I like to hear, and I don't, and, and let's be clear, folks, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a requirement per se, but is to see that people are active locally before they move on to a little bit higher position. Uh, certainly, some people do very well. Uh, they can they can go on to a state or even the national level, and they can perform very very well. But I think for most people, um, one of the ways that you can prepare yourself is to work at the the smaller level. Uh, before you get to the the larger one. And there's any number of reasons. Maybe one day I will put out a podcast talking about my thoughts on that. That's not for this show. So I uh, commend you. I, I think that's a great thing. So let's talk about the position itself. Why did you choose vice chair versus any other? Is it just because that's the role that you've done so you feel very comfortable in? Or did you feel like that you had something specific that you specifically wanted to bring to the Florida delegation? So it's a combination of those two things. Okay. Yes, I am familiar with what a vice chair does, and I've done it for a number of years, and I do think that my experience lends itself to being successful in that role at a state level. Okay. Believe me, it was something that, had we not moved, I would have considered in New York, and okay. it's something I wanted to consider down here. So that, that, that's the first piece. The second piece is what do we want to accomplish? Now, there are a couple of things. I, I will... To add on to the resume, I did do some things at the LPNY level. The thing I'm most proud of is my work in ballot access, which is not an easy thing. I'm sure people have heard the rumors and the stories of what's been going on in New York with mm -hmm. ballot access. But I will tell you that I and a select few other people put together the largest petition drive in Libertarian Party history, given the time frame. 
There are ones that have collected more signatures. We only had six weeks to do it. But here's what I learned from that. There is no such thing as a petition drive that is not doable by the Libertarian Party. Okay. Here's what I want to bring. Like, I am a pure blood libertarian. And when I say that, I hate giving money to the state. I despise it more than almost any action that I could take. And when I heard we have ballot access down here, I'm like, great. That's amazing. What does that mean? Oh, well, usually we just pay to get on the ballot. I went, nope, don't like it. What, what else? What, what other, what else you got? And they said, well, we can petition to get on the ballot. It's not so bad. And so one of the first conversations I had was with a, a gentleman over in Brevard County. And he indicated that he's running for a local election where he needs 900 some odd signatures. I believe the 916. And he's got okay. time to do it. So the first thing we want to talk about is how can we do that and do it successfully so you don't have to pay any, uh, any extra money to the state. So this is something I want to implement around the state. And by, by that, I don't mean by decree. I mean by offering up my expertise, by building a how-to playbook on how to do it, and offering myself. If there's one thing I will tell your viewers and you about me, my leadership style is not by decree. It is very much put me on the ground. I would not ask anyone to do anything that I am not willing to do myself. Okay. So if it comes to, we got to make calls to fundraise to make this happen, put me on the phone. If it comes to, we got a petition to make this happen, put me on the streets. That is what we have to do. We cannot be the type of people that lead from afar, but when tasked with doing the, the work on the ground, that we don't do it. I was one of the leaders of the petition drive in New York, but I also was one of the top signature gatherers. That's something I take a lot of pride in, that, I, that we, you go out there and you learn a skill and you get good at it. But that is one of, the, one of the many things that I do think I can bring to the position. I would like to say that if I had a successful term, it meant that we spent zero dollars paying to get people on the ballot. That would be an amazing thing. And I think that we're capable capable of doing it. The key to that is getting ourselves organized and knowing how to put together a proper petition. Drive. Gotcha. And just so anybody that's watching is aware, when we talk about ballot access, there is a major difference between New York and Florida. Florida is one of the states where we say we don't have a ballot access issue. Whereas I believe in New York, they can and have had ballot access issues. And what that means is while our candidates may need to pay or 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 um or or uh, a petition go out and, and collect pet, uh, petitions this is a more standard thing across the board for all parties when we talk about like new york or some other states that have ballot access access issues that's where i believe if, and this is where you can correct me if i'm wrong they uh there are situations where even a petition or paying money um, won't get like a regular local candidate on the ballot because they cannot get on the ballot because they're not recognized as a party. Is that correct? Yeah. So you're basically petitioning as an independent and you can put whatever name next to your independent petition that you want, mm -hmm. but you're not recognized as a political party. In the state of New York, there are only four parties that are recognized, Democrat, Republican, and then their subsidiary parts, which are the conservative party for the Republicans and the working family for the Democrats. Okay. They have ballot access. They have minimal requirements signature wise. They just kind of go to their people and be like, Hey, sign this. We'll get, you know, we're getting a candidate. Right. That. If you're a libertarian and you're running a local race, say in my old district in you're running city council, 2023, you would need 450 signatures. A Democrat would need probably something like 50 and of registered Democrats, which is really easy. You can go to one Democrat meeting and knock that out. Right. Whereas we have to get, 450 independent signatures of people that have not previously signed another petition. Right. And then submit them and deal with any challenges that come our way. We could submit 700 signatures, but if we're not ready to defend those signatures, we could still get thrown off the ballot. So there's a lot more that can happen when you're running as an independent than if you are an actual party. Right. And that's what we ran into. And that's what we've been dealing with since 2020 in New York when the laws were changed. And I don't want to get into that whole thing because that's a New York issue that right. thankfully we don't have to worry about here. That's New York's cross the bear. Right. I just want to make sure that anybody listening is, is kind of aware, like in other States, 
there are situations where your party isn't recognized and then the, the battle is even much more uphill than Florida where we just have the, the standard run of the mill. And I don't even think that our uh, comparisons between the parties are that different. Uh, I know in other states, some of them are, some of them, even the Republicans in the, uh, what's going on with my, my, my camera feed here? I don't know what's going on. But uh, in other states, there are issues where, um, it's weird, I don't know what's going on with the, the video feed here, but uh, we'll continue on. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that it looks wonky to you as well. There we okay. go. I'm, I'm not so sure what happened there. Um, but at any rate, so uh, so so I, I'm pointing that out so that people understand um, the value of what you're saying is you're coming from a state where the challenges were much greater, and now you're now, now you're in a state where the challenges are much less, but you're bringing that experience to improve where we happen to be are uh, where we happen to be, even if it's a, in a better position than a state like New York or some of the other states where it's a really, really big deal about having ballot access for the, the party itself. Yes. And, and as I said, when you are faced with these things and you have a limited time, most of the time you're going to end up spending money paying petitioners. That's money that your campaign has raised. That's money that your county organization has raised. That's money that your state organization has paid has raised. In some cases, in our case, for when we were doing the Larry Sharp drive, that's money that national raised that you're that you're going to to ask for money. Right. That's money that doesn't have to be spent on those things. That can probably better be spent on things like, and again, I'll point to the successes you guys had, putting up a a, a billboard, putting right. up. Uh, signs on people's lawns. These are things that are going to get votes. We lose that money to the state when we pay them to get on the ballot. If we have that extra money, we spend it on more road signs. We spend it on more right. advertising. We spend it on whatever it is that's going to help us get more votes and ultimately help, help us get elected. Right. Okay. So, um, so ballot, uh, uh, improving the ballot access for our candidates. Um, now what's your, uh, what is your vision or what is your role, um, that you feel that you can play in getting more candidates? Cause that's all, that's always a big challenge, right? Getting people to run for these offices and then not only getting people to run, but getting the right people to run. I mean, we've seen plenty of libertarian candidates who, you know, there's a strong argument, and we'll, I'll just say it: uh, they shouldn't be running. They 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 are not in the right position. Maybe it's not the right time now, or maybe that that running as a candidate is really not for them. So, wh wh where do you fit in with that particular um, part of the equation? So, the hardest thing about becoming a good candidate is you either have people that are overly aspirational. And I don't see it as negative. I, I actually respect the heck out of it. Like people who go, I'm going to run for Senate. I'm going to run for governor. I'm going to run for president. Never really run for much of anything else, but really want to run for that thing because, you know, the person that has that job now, they really don't like. It's all great. We've talked a lot about the local strategy, but the question is, how do we accomplish that? Because when you do that and look, at the end of the day, the Republicans and Democrats, that's what they do. They're not taking, like, look at the state of Florida. Do you think Ron DeSantis' first job was governor? It's usually not. Right. right? He, he's been in politics for the better part of ever. Now, I'm not saying we should be breeding career politicians, but I do think you need to bring a modicum of political success to the table if you're running for those type of offices. So here's how I, I think we ought to go about it. We need to know and understand every race that is possible every year. And we need to look at the most local of those races that are impactful as libertarians. What do I mean by that? Maybe it's a school board. Maybe it's a county office in a smaller county. Maybe it's a town board. That's going to get you experience and they're winnable. And they're winnable because you don't have to run necessarily as a libertarian because that word is still scary to people. But if you're running as Eric Cordova or D.L. Cummings and I am someone you've seen at school because my kid goes to that school and you've seen me at the Strawberry Festival because I like strawberries and I take my family there. Right. And you've seen me at town board meetings because I wanted to complain that there are way too many cameras up or whatever, whatever it is I was there for. I'm a concerned citizen. Those are the things that make you viable. So people go. 
oh yeah, I know DL. I vote for him. It doesn't even matter what your party affiliation is at that point. Because right. the people are looking at it at a human level. Once you have experience, then people are going to look at it as, oh, that guy served on his town board and then his county board. Yeah, I'd probably vote for him for state representative. And now they're looking at libertarians for the first time because they know what you've done in a public office and they know you've been successful at it. So how do we do that and how do we help at a state level? Here's what we do. We make sure that we have organized people on a committee that do the research to find out every single election every single year. It sounds daunting, but once you have it, you put it in a Google Drive and it's always there for you. It's information that we can continue to use. And then we pass that information along to the county affiliates. This is who we need to empower because I'm not going to know who should be running Duval County. I never will, unless I move to Duval and I really get to know everybody. But as of now, I'm a Hillsborough resident. Right. I might know who the best people to run in Hillsborough are. And when we do, we can look at which races maybe are best suited for them. But we also can make sure we have quality county organizations and make sure that our county affiliate committee are breeding quality county organizations so that people want to come to you and say, I want to run for office. That has happened in Queens, where I used to live. People came to us and said, I'm interested in running. And one of our best candidates came to us and said, I want to run on this particular issue. And I heard that libertarians are big on it. And we were like, actually, yeah, we are. That issue was occupational licensing and that there's way too much of it in New York City. And we ran like basically a single issue campaign for city council. And it was one of the most successful city council races. There were some issues along the way, but it was a good message to get out. And mm -hmm. he was someone who was a concerned citizen that people knew. So he would just have these like dinners in local places and people would just show up. They're like, oh, yeah, I know. I know Siraj. That was his name. I know Siraj. I'm going to show up to this thing. And he built this like little coalition of people. And it was really nice to see. He was not someone who was already a hard bred libertarian. He was someone that heard about libertarians, knew that we were doing something good and knew we could support his campaign. And we did. Right. That's what we can do. Awesome. All right. So let me ask you the tough question now. Okay. So a moment ago and it, it, out of just fun, we were, I was like, Hey, you know, if, you know, you're moving to Florida or, you, you know, and I was kind of like joking about you, uh, you know, running away from, uh, from New York and coming here and all that. But here's a real question uh, related to the Florida delegation. Since you are relatively new, how familiar, familiar are you with the vibe and the feel of this particular delegation? Because as I look across the U S and I just kind of observe and hear things and watch things, um, I get the sense that there are different vibes from state to state. I don't know why my I'm kind of weird. I don't know. Folks, we'll have to deal with this uh, camera thing. I don't know what's going on. But there's a different vibe, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, and sometimes it's only slightly different from one state to the other. And sometimes it's very, very vastly different. Yeah. Um, for instance, I would say that the uh, the New Hampshire folk are pretty much drastically different than anybody else. Right. Yeah. And that's not a slam on them. I just think that they have their particular like libertarian culture that's that that they've got going on there it's you know probably a lot to do with the uh, the free state project um and so you get these differences so how familiar are you with our delegation and in the vibe that we've ha that we have um at least you know and you don't have to be able to you don't have to necessarily say well back in 2016 i remember this and but just just a general idea of where we are as a delegation yeah so well first of all i, I think it's important to understand those things and one of the things that my wife and I did was we attended a lot of different conventions over the past couple of years. And that was in part just to meet other libertarians and also in part just to see how they do things differently than what we're used to, because mm -hmm. we wanted to understand that. Secondly, of course, we sat right by you guys at national convention. Uh, the New York delegation was like two rows behind the Florida delegation. And knowing that we were considering a move at that time, that was back in May, we, I, I made sure to meet a lot of the people from the Florida delegation. Okay. That's your opportunity, right? It's, it's not so easy to do that in other places, but if you're going to the national convention, the goal is that you represent Florida's interests. So I thought it would be in my interest to meet these people, not knowing then that I was considering a run for executive board, but just that I wanted to ingratiate myself to what Florida libertarians are like and what they're mm -hmm. doing. 
since I we've gotten here, I I mean, you know this. I, I came to your guys' event in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get to know what was going on there. And I knew that other libertarians are coming from different corners of the state because it was an important event. I think the most important thing is to do those things. Actually, just on Friday, uh, we attended the Pinellas County event, which is our neighbor county right. over in uh, Tampa Bay. So why? Because we want to see what they're doing. And we want to right. make sure that they know that we can be partners to them. We're not adversaries. Right. We're partners. And you're right. I mean, there's definitely a different kind of vibe with them and with probably some of the people that I've worked with in the past. That's okay. Right. It's important to know those things. And look, I will tell you that my professional training does lend itself to this. Like I said, I'm a recruiter. Part of being a good recruiter is understanding how to deal with different types of people. Like I'm a construction management, architecture, and engineering recruiter. I deal with superintendents who are tatted up, you know, like all along their arms and everywhere, and they are rough and gruff, and they're going to drive people to get stuff done. And then I deal with project managers who are shirt and not, you know, suit and tie, and they've never said a curse word in their life, and they're the ones going to the board meetings and everything in between. Architects are like the artsy, designy type of people, right? I'm dealing with different types of people, sometimes minute by minute in my job. And you have to be able to pivot and, and deal with those things. It's an important life skill to have. So coming to Florida, it's important to understand that a people are just different down here in general, let alone libertarians. Right. And B, go get to know them, see what they actually need, what they're actually looking at, what's important to them. And that's what we've been trying to do. Just get out to the different communities, get to know who they are and what they want. And that started, like I said, back in May. And I've been trying as much as I can to just reach out to different people as I saw them on Discord, on Facebook, on Twitter. Hey, you're in Florida. Let's get to know each other, you know? And then let them know, hey, I'm also running for an office, so I'm glad we got to know each other. Hopefully we can work together. Should I have this office or not? And hopefully I've done a good job with that. I want to continue to do that whether or not I win. But that's where we're at right now. Okay. All right. That's fair. Um, So what other kind of things other than, say, ballot access and candidates are you looking to bring to the Florida delegation? Because I know, you know, there's there's organizational things that we could talk about. There's fundraising. There's all these different things that um, that that are up in the air for candidates, you know, uh, who, who, who might be looking and saying, hey, here's an area where I think I can um, I can take it to the next level. Um, so what, what are some other things that you are hoping that you can take to the next level, even if it's minor? I mean, it doesn't have to be huge. So the biggest thing, as I said before, I view the position of vice chair kind of like a point guard in basketball, Mm -hmm. which is good because it's good for me because I'm not a tall guy. So I never played center. I play point guard. And what that means is you're a distributor. Get the ball to people who are better than you Mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are going to do the scoring. And I've always kind of seen my position in that way. And I still do. And that's what I'm going to look to do. So as I said before, I immediately said, when we're talking about candidate support, or affiliate support. I want to put the power to do that in the hands of people who've been successful at doing it. Like my vision for that would be, let's get the top five affiliates together, the chairs and vice chairs maybe of those affiliates, and that's your committee. And then add a couple of people on growing affiliates to that committee. And now we're starting to understand different levels of where people are at. But but the important thing is we want to take from people who've been successful. And take that information and bring it other places. It's great what you guys are doing over in Duval. But wouldn't you like to see that in half the counties, three quarters of the counties in Florida, running multiple candidates year over year? Having that would be that would be amazing. That's the goal. And I know it's not a thing that can happen overnight, but the way that we can go about it is to understand how we can organize to do it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean to empower my position, it means to allow what I'm doing in my position to be a delegator to the people that have been successful in these things. Like, I think the fear of anyone coming in and wanting to hold a position like this is that there's something of a power grab going on. And that's not it. Like it's important that you understand that you can use this to kind of go like this, just go this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And I'm here to support you. I'm here to support what you guys need to do. 
Right now, this this affiliate is running candidates. We got to figure out how to help them do that. So as I said before, are we have we targeted what they should be running? Are we providing them that support? Are we teaching them how to how to do ballot access? Again, that's a huge thing because it's not just about saying we're going to do it, but are we providing the right resources for that? Right. Training for it, things like that. Are we then fundraising properly so we can delegate money out to those affiliates? It's there's a lot, and I don't want to claim that I'm an expert at all of these things. I'd be lying to say that I was. Mm-hmm. I know I'm not, and I think I think that's important to note too. I want to put people who are more of an expert at all of these things in positions where they can help. That's what I'd like to do, and I think that's what a good vice chair ought to be doing is empowering people who are good at stuff, right? Like if you, I'll be honest with you, like I suck at social media. I don't ever put me as the head of the social media committee. Don't do right. it. Right. Like admittedly, I'm like the old, like I'm 38 and I feel like an old man when it comes to that stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I know you're yeah, like, you're, around my age and you're better at it than me, but like, I, you know, I like, Oh, there's TikTok now. I'm like, I don't, I, I wear a watch that goes TikTok. I don't know. Um, right. No, I, I've completely avoided, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 44, so yeah. uh, I'm an old man, uh, definitely. And, and there are certainly better, uh, there are whippersnappers out there that are way better at social media. Um, yeah. and there's social media that I refuse to touch. I, I refuse to get on TikTok because one, I don't have time. And then two, um, just looking at some of the videos, I'm like, I don't know that I can produce um, quality content that fits within what makes somebody successful on that particular social media platform. Right? Like I, I do well enough on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm not really that great on Facebook. And I, I, I don't think that I would be very good at all on TikTok or many of the other ones that are out there as well. So I, I agree with you. Let me ask you though, because you're saying like, it's easy for you to come in and say like, hey, don't put me on here, right? Like I'm not very good at it. Because you recognize at least in this one particular area that you're yeah. not very good at it. Right. So, so it's an easy, it's an easy win right there. Like if I'm in leadership and I'm looking for somebody to do social media, it's an easy win not to put, you know, Eric in social media where maybe he doesn't belong. Right. Right. Well, what about people who um, need to be told that, or maybe even need to be convinced, maybe people that, you know, that are trying to do a good job, but that's not really their wheelhouse. They're not in the right spot. How do you, how do you get like, cause I'm a firm believer that one of leadership's jobs is to put people in the right position because if people are in the wrong position, they will not be successful, nor will the organization in, w- w- within respect of that role. Um, so how do you manage getting people to the right position when there's a disconnect and they're not like you a moment ago saying, don't put me here. I don't belong here. What if they're like, no, I'm, re- I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good at this and I've worked really hard and, you know, uh, you know, I want to be here. How do you get somebody to the right role? It's what I do professionally. Again, um, okay. I am a professional listener. That's what a recruiter is. A lot of people think that recruiters are salespeople. We are. A lot of people think salespeople are talkers. We're not. Sa- great salespeople are great listeners. It's important to listen to people and know who people are. Then you can make those assessments. So to give you an example from professional life, there are plenty of people that will sell me on different things. To give you the example of construction people, if you have somebody that does what's called corporate interiors, that's like office spaces, right? They renovate office space. Right. It's huge business now because offices are constantly changing. Companies are constantly changing where they're going. Huge business if you're in construction. But if those same people were tasked with doing facade work or doing a ground up project, there's a lot of other components that go into running those type of jobs. Plus, they're much larger. Mm -hmm. You're going to get people who will sell you on that. Like, hey, I've been doing construction for 30 years and I can do that. You've never done it. I don't think you'll be successful in that way. But there's a way that I can approach that and say, look, let's, let's actually understand where you're at and where your skill set is going to best fit. And I'm not trying to detract you. I'm not trying to put you down. What I am saying is, and this is where we, you know, we're, we're not even a team. Like the team is me and the candidate working together to find them their next opportunity. Right. In the case of the Libertarian Party of Florida, we're all teammates. And mm-hmm. I sincerely hope 
that everyone sees themselves as that and that we don't see ourselves as adversaries. Like I don't see myself as an adversary to the gentleman that is running against me for vice chair or whoever else may take a nomination. We're not enemies. Right. We're teammates. It's important that we see that if we're having that conversation, it's because we should have the same goals in mind. We want to do successful things in the libertarian world. So it would behoove people like me to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. To say, like, let's talk about how you want to make an impact. What are you trying to accomplish with this? And then if they trust me, and I hope that they do, when I give my assessment, they understand it's coming from a place of I want to empower you. It's not coming from a place where I'm putting you down for something that you've done, especially if you're better at it than me. It's coming from a place of we want to put everyone in position to succeed. Everyone. That's as Florida, but that's also as you. Where are you going to be best suited? Because we all have lives. None of us have 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week to dedicate to this thing. Right. Time is your most valuable weapon. It's important that you wield it properly. Awesome. Okay. Um so let me ask you, I, let's see, I'm looking at the time here. I, I didn't, I don't think I told you before, and I'm going to try to keep this, you know, somewhere around the 45 minute range, but Hey, if we're going well, you know, we could extend a little bit longer and that's fine too. Um, that does happen from time to time. So uh, I just want to respect your time. Speaking of time being a valuable thing. Um, so right now in Florida, as far as I know, we are not having any major source of conflict. Other States are, we don't really need to go into the details. Uh, you know, anybody that's watching that's familiar with libertarians, uh, we, we know that there's always some level of infighting. Sometimes it gets really bad. And sometimes it's just, you know, this low key stuff that just kind of happens, you know, just because people are butting heads, um, you know, and I, and I think there's a certain amount of inevitability to that. So as you know, to me, I look at the leadership and I say one of your number one jobs, one of them is to lead people and to help intervene when there's the conflict that's going on or ensure that there is um that the members are too busy uh you know doing exciting things to have time for the infighting right so while while our delegation is not having any conflict right now not any significant one i mean i'm sure there's something somewhere going on but there's nothing significant how do you maintain that what what is it what are the kind of things that that your uh, your experience, you know, both professionally and um, with LP Queens, you know, and, and another another delegation, so an entirely different set of libertarians. What kind of things will you bring to the table to help minimize any outbreak of conflict? Because right now there is there there is this um, there is this. Uh, I'm trying to think of how to say it exactly, but but what we have is out there generally there is a problem waiting to happen right now because and and I, and I guess i'll just come right out with that we've got the mises caucus they've you know they've taken over the party a lot of people are unhappy with that um and they continue they're continually unhappy and so there's a little bit of conflict between uh the the mises caucus crowd and the non-mises caucus crowd um we're not really having that level of conflict here in florida so how do you maintain keeping us from getting to that point where we we have some sort of blow up. What kind of things are you bringing to, to help ensure that we can continue to work together as we have been? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the easiest things that I can bring to the table is I'm one of those guys that's been around a while mm -hmm. and I've never been the only I always joke. The only caucus I'm actually in is the pro wrestling caucus. OK, and that's just because it was simply unavoidable. Like it's just like I've always been a wrestling fan. So I was like, all right, well, this is a thing. And it, all right, cool. So fine. I'm part of it. And this is like the Hulk Hogan type wrestling, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And just making sure, uh, you know, I, that's what I thought. Cause I don't, I don't really follow sports very well. So <laughs> it's not sports. It's sports entertainment. Okay. See, see, there yeah. you go right there. See, I'm showing my colors of ignorance. <laughs> that's no, it's always the joke. Is that like, cause what is it? Right. Like, cause it's predetermined. Look, we can, talk honestly here we know that's what it is right but yeah, it's predetermined entry but again i i've never got involved with that stuff but part of that is because i've always been the type i can get along with pretty much anyone 
Mm -hmm. And I think what I can bring to the table is that I can get along with pretty much anyone. And again, that I can bring my listening skills to do that. If we start to see conflict, let's nip it in the bud before it becomes a side versus side. Let it be individual versus individual. That's fine. We can mitigate those things. But as long as we're in a good position now, and I, I think it provides interesting self-reflection to say, look, at the end of the day, and, and I'll say this to everybody that's listening, I truly believe that most of the people you're going to meet on both sides of this equation are good people that want to do libertarian things, that want to make the world more libertarian, that want to elect people that are libertarians. I really believe that. I know that there's a lot of vitriol that has come out outside of Florida where that really has not been the message. The message has been one side of these people are really bad, but I'm a libertarian. I'm a believer in the power of the individual. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in every person of whatever group you want to you want to lump them into are exactly the same. So I think it's important to treat people as individuals, hear them as individuals, listen to I, I feel like I'm doing the uh, have you ever seen White Man Can't Jump? Uh, it, it's, it's been a while, but yes, it's been a you long don't while. listen to Jimmy. You got to hear Jimmy. I'm talking about Jimi Hendrix, but I'm, I'm a That's bit of an old movie buff. So like I'll drop those here. You know, if people like that kind of thing. I may have to drop a couple of those into my speech come this weekend, but right. I think it's important that we see people and hear people's individuals. I think if we keep it to that, that is the thing at its core that's going to allow us to stay away from that fray. And that we treat people that way, that we're, we don't see someone coming in that's not in our group as the enemy, but just as another person who cares and might not agree with us and everything, but they probably agree with us on about 80% of stuff. Right. That's a good starting place. So I, I hope that's something I can bring. If nothing else, my wife likes to remind me all the time. I'm a pretty patient guy and it is one of my positive traits. So hopefully the fact that I do bring some patience to it and I'm not going to snap and exacerbate the damn thing and make it worse. Right. Hopefully it's a trait that people can see in me that can help from a leadership perspective. Fair enough. I think it's good to have people with patience. I'm not one of those people with patience. Um, a lot of people might be mistakenly they might mistakenly think that i am very very patient they're like oh it's liberty dad blah 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 and he's like you know no no i i have my short fuse um and and it's usually around project management when when projects are going and then uh that's when the profanities will start coming out when things aren't going my way so um i can always appreciate somebody that remains patient um especially with other people or situations the environment and, and such like that because it's just not a skill that i've been ever, ever really been able to cultivate so kudos on that at least um uh, okay um so you know i i, I don't want to just make this like a whole bunch of 20 questions but what else you know like like like, like let's kind of do a little bit more dialogue here and just you know wrapping thing you know why starting to wind down what kind of things you know, have I not mentioned that you would like people to know about um, as far as maybe what you plan on doing, what results you hope to achieve, um, you know, maybe why people need to look at you and say, man, this this guy is really the right guy for the job. He's got these particular qualities that um, that I think are perfect for that role. You know, what, what are some of those things, you know, off the top of your head that maybe I didn't mention? Well, let me ask you a question. All right, because let's do it. You just ran candidates. How many elected libertarians are in the state of Florida right now? Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I, as far as I know, there is there's one that I know of. Okay, two. Okay, I know there's. there's a, let's, let's see if I get that one right. Let's just see if I get it. Right. I believe that is in Al, uh, Altamonte Springs. If um, I'm not mistaken, that's one of them. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so that would be Jim Turney. And then who is the second one? I'm probably going to be like, oh, I, I forgot that offhand, but the reason I wanted to bring that number to the table, because it's important. We are one of the largest states. I believe right now we're number four in registered libertarians. Okay. Right. We're, I mean, Florida is also one of the biggest population states in the country. Right. And I think we're number four in registered libertarians and we have two elected. Right. That's a problem. And okay. I'm going to say that straight up. So it's not something that can be solved overnight. No, we, we do have to understand that. But our North Star has to be that when we come to the table, 
because we're coming to the table in 2023 and we're electing a new chair and vice chair and a bunch of other board positions, right? When we come together two years later, that number needs to be higher. It needs to be, or at the very least, we need to be well on our way to that. I mean, because look, right. we're, we're talking about we have two election seasons, basically, 2023, 2024. Mm-hmm. If we're going to 2025 and we are running a record amount of candidates, and a lot of those are in races that we've targeted that we can win, we're doing our job. But our North Star has to be those things. We are a political party. I think there's a lot of value in our, us as a community. But I think we have to always remember what we're actually here for. We're a political party. Our job is to win elections. Okay. And then, and this is the part that no one talks about, because we always say, oh, we have to win elections. Great. Then what? Then we have to make an impact in those jobs as libertarians. Not only make our voices heard, but we got to play politics. We got to get people on our side and get stuff passed that moves legislation in a libertarian direction. That's what we need to do. I can show you examples of that, even in New York City, where people have done that. It's not easy, but that's what you're getting elected to do. Right. So that's what we have. That's where we have to be. How can, but, but we're not there yet. We need to get to a point where we are getting dangerously close to, if not higher than double digit elected libertarians. And like I said, if we have that as our North Star, then we know all the other things that have to play into that. We know that we need to fundraise to help these people out. We know that we have to be organized so we run proper ballot access drives. So we're not paying an extra dime to the state that we could be spending on campaign. Which, by the way, campaign finance is a lot easier here than it is in like almost the entire country. We need to take advantage of that. Like, right. There's not laws saying you can't talk to the campaign team if you're the county organization. That's a wonderful thing. Makes things a lot easier. Many states, you can't do that. So we need to take advantage of that. These are things that we can be doing and using to our advantage to get libertarians elected. Now, here's the other part to that. As I said, going back to the the whole plan, and I I got all this stuff written out, and I hope that the people that I would potentially work with, should I win, are ready to, to hear these things and work together. Maybe I've screwed up along the way, and maybe there's a better way that we can do it but these are the things that we need to have as tasks Mm -hmm. my understanding the last few years we've done a pretty good job at starting to build the infrastructure of lp florida into something that's workable and we're continuing to do that that's excellent that means we have a foundation but again i work in construction in recruiting once you have the foundation you got to start building the walls you got to start building out the mechanical systems the plumbing systems the boring stuff Mm-hmm. Right. You look at your house, right. you're, not, you're not going, wow, this house has great plumbing. But you know it's there and you know you wouldn't buy the house without it. Right. So that's what we need to do. We need to have all those things. How do we target the right races? How do we always have money in our coffers that we can spend for these things? How do we make sure that we're supporting our county organizations to do the right things in these cases? Those are the things that need to be on test to focus on our North Star of, we can't be that state anymore. We cannot be the state that comes and says, we have two two registered libertarians elected to office when we are a recognized political party. We're not dealing with the ballot access stuff. We can run anyone we want. We We need to be the example to the rest of the country of how you get libertarians elected. I cannot say more passionately because this is my life. This is what, I do. This is what I love. This is why I'm doing it, right? Like, you don't do this unless it's in your heart to do it. I'm doing it because I care about these things. I want Florida actually to be a libertarian beacon. Not for us just pretend it is. Like, we've been, right? We're one of the freest states in the country, are we? Or can we be a whole heck of a lot more free if we start getting some libertarians elected? That's our North Star. Let's get it done. Awesome. All right. So I don't have any more questions. And I mean, you got any closing words or you just want to leave it on that note? Here's here's my simple closing remark. I have a life event coming up in my life. At the end of August, uh, my wife and I uh, are going to be having our first child together. Congratulations. Thank you. We chose to move to Florida. 
And part of that choice is we wanted to raise a family here. But that doesn't mean that we decided that Florida is a perfect utopia to raise a child. In. Mm -hmm. It means that we felt that the potential is there for Florida to be an amazing place for that. The only way that I know to make Florida the amazing place it ought to be to raise my family and your family and everyone else's family is to make it more libertarian. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why we're on this show right now, despite my terrible lighting and my plain white wall and whatever it is that I look like. It, that None of that matters. What matters right. is the reason that we're here is so we can move Florida in a more libertarian direction. And we know the ways to do it. It's not easy. It's going to take a lot of work. But we do have some advantages in place that are going to help us along the way. What I'm offering to people is let me be one of those beacons to help get this thing moving toward our North Star. Our North Star is getting more people elected, identifying who those people ought to be, identifying the races that we can win, and becoming an attractive vehicle for people that are thinking, you know, I'd love to be on the school board, but I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. Maybe they're a libertarian and they just don't know it yet. There's a lot of people like that out there. Maybe they're ready to make an impact and we can show them the way, but we can only do that if we are built up at our county levels and we're only going to build up at our county levels if at a state level we can use the people who have done that to delegate that out we're only going to help people win elections if we know which elections to target and how and that we have the ability to raise money and give it to them all these things go hand in hand that's why you need a point guard to help run this thing let me be that point guard let me take the charge when need be I'll take a seven footer running into my chest if I need to for you guys. That I'll do. I plan to do it for my child. I'll do it for my wife. I'll do it for the Libertarian Party of Florida. Let me take the bullets. Let me give you guys the ammo. How's that sound? All right, folks. Well, you heard him. Um, Eric, hold backstage for just a moment and uh, let me get my closing out. And then we'll, you know, we'll chit chat in a, in a moment. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you feel a little bit more empowered. Uh, where you want to put your vote? Come this weekend, uh, this this weekend, uh, April 21st, 22nd and 23rd. I believe all the elections will be on the 22nd uh, during the business meeting. And I, ho I hope you enjoyed listening to uh, Eric. And I hope the things that you heard today will help you make up your mind who you want to have as the vice chair for your state party.